discussion after our panel talk, so don't uh, tire out your voices quite yet. Uh, good evening and welcome to the Brewer Center. My name is Jane Weiser and I'm the Executive Director here for several more days at least. <laughs> Um, welcome to tonight's program, which is called Borough Vision 2020, and I'm thrilled to see so many people from the community that are here this evening to talk about our wonderful village. Um, this is the first of what we hope is a series of discussions on the borough. The idea for a community discussion started several months ago as we were in the dead of winter. Several groups of concerned citizens met to discuss the current state of affairs in the borough. How are the merchants faring in the off season? Do we have enough public engagement in civic and government activities? What are nonprofit roles in our community were just some of the questions that were addressed by these groups. So tonight, we are broadening our discussion and bringing the conversation to the community as a whole. And this is just the start. We will hear from our panel of presenters that are sitting up here right now. But more importantly, we want to hear from you, the audience, as well. So please, as you listen this evening, think about questions, comments, suggestions that you would like to add to the conversation. We have plenty of time to hear from the whole group. So with that, also please turn off your cell phones. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd like to begin with Jason Vincent, who is Stonington's Director of Planning, who will be moderating the discussion this evening. Welcome, Jason. Great. Thank you, Jade, and thank you all for being here. It's great to see this type of interest, uh, especially on a Thursday evening on a beautiful uh, summer night, so uh, we appreciate that you're here. When the conversation began, as Jane mentioned, a number of different uh, stakeholders came together and were starting to pick at some of the issues that they felt the borough should be addressing as we move forward as a community. It became a realization that we needed to plan, that we need to think about what those issues are, assess them, and perhaps come up with strategies to move forward. To do that plan, the inventory is a critical component. And your participation in an inventory is why we're here tonight. So our goal, the goals this evening are twofold. One is to listen to some of the issues from some of the stakeholders that were part of the initial process, and they'll do those presentations. And then the second is we want to hear from you. We don't have a huge amount of time to do that this evening, but we plan on doing a number of these different forums in the future. The, the key for tonight is planting some of the seeds of ideas as part of that inventory phase so that we can go through this process to, to assess what the issues may be, and then as a community come together and determine whether or not we should do something. Um, a plan doesn't always result in a decision to act, but when you do an alternatives assessment, one of the options is always do nothing, and that's one of the choices that we have as a community. But if there are other things, other options that are more compelling, more interesting to us, that, have, uh, that are valuable to our ideas, the plan gives us the tools to, to figure out how to move forward. So I just wanted to frame that out to you before we begin the presentations. Uh, we, we are looking right now this evening at a hard adjourn at 7 o'clock. So when we get to that time, uh, it's my job to, uh, to, to manage the process. Our first speaker this evening is going to be Jeff Callahan, the, the Borough Warden, and you'll see in the program uh, his background. So Jeff, if you want to come up here, please. Thank you, Jason. And uh, again, I'm also very pleased to see such a large turnout to uh, listen to and talk about the, uh, the place we all care, care so much about. Uh, as a community, Stonington Borough depends on three entities to uh, define itself and to create its vitality. The not-for-profits, the merchants and fishermen, and the government. But only one of these is essential to its existence as a municipality in the state of Connecticut, and that, of course, is, is the government. Simply put, no government, uh, no borough as, as a municipality. And I'm sad to report that that is a real possibility if, if we continue on the track we're on now. Let me give an example. About 20 years ago when I first ran for office, I'd never run for office in my life, I guess maybe in high school or something, um, 
and uh, of course I've lost. But there were <laughs> there were there were two full <laughs> slates of of, uh, of candidates running uh, actively against each other, and I might add civilly as well. Um, and several hundred people voted in that election. In the last two elections, 2013 and 2015, both parties, that is the Democrats and Republicans, struggled to fill all the open positions. Uh, and uh, everybody who ran was elected, and we still had one vacancy. And as opposed to 20 years ago, when several hundred people voted, 66 people voted in 2015. 66 people. Probably about the number that's in this room. Why is this happening? I'm sure a political scientist could identify a number of causes for this, this trend, but one of them is obvious even to a layperson, and that's this. Uh, in 1900, when the first U.S. Census uh, uh, enumerated the boroughs separately from the rest of the town, there were something like 2,000 and uh, well, there were about 2,000 people living in the borough. Today there are 924 who consider this their residence. So that's a we're now about 40 percent of the size we were in uh, a little over a century ago. So clearly this has a large impact on uh, how we sustain the borough government as well as other things. I will talk about what the borough government does and how it works in a few minutes, but first a little bit of history. Stonington Borough was chartered by the state of Connecticut in May of 1801. We were the second borough to be established in the state. Bridgeport was the first. We are now the oldest borough still in existence. It's not clear why uh, this borough was formed. Probably it's because the people who lived in the village area wanted some amenities like gas street lights or, or something like that that the the rest of the town, which was largely rural, did not uh, want to pay for with their taxes. At the time, by the way, the, the population of the entire town of Stonington was about 3,000, and the borough probably had a few hundred people uh, living here on the peninsula. Over the course of the 19th century, the number of boroughs in the state of Connecticut grew uh, to uh, a maximum in the early 20th century of about 26. That was the peak of the borough movement. And again, uh, these, these were little villages where probably the surrounding rural uh, folks didn't want to pay for whatever the amenities were that they wanted. Uh, most of the boroughs have since become either cities like Bridgeport or the city of Robin or have simply been disestablished and absorbed back into the surrounding uh, town. So at the present time, there are uh, nine boroughs in the state of Connecticut. Stonia Borough Government performs four uh, primary functions. First and foremost is fire protection. And uh, it's obviously critical given the the density, the construction, and the uh, age of, the, of most of the buildings in the borough. Our fire, our, our fire department is the only municipal department in the town of Stonington. There are six departments in the town of Stonington. The other five are all uh, fire districts. And fire districts under Connecticut law are, are totally independent of the municipality in which they reside. So they, they have their own taxing authority, and uh, if you live anywhere else in town, you can get a separate bill for your tax, uh, for your fire protection. <clears throat> about one third of the borough budget and about half of the uh, property tax revenue supports the fire department. At this mill rate, the, the borough fire department is one of the least costly in the town of Stanton. The second vital function that the borough government uh, performs is maintenance of the streets, including repairs, plowing, sweeping, drainage, and signage. A significant portion of the cost, about 80%, is actually reimbursed from the town 
uh, astonishing under state uh, law that requires that. And the same two people who uh, are, are our street department, Roger uh, Colello and, and Sue Cadero, uh, also take, uh, uh, pick up the brush once a month, uh, empty public trash receptacles, and maintain our, our six parks, uh, among other tasks they do. The third function of the government is the regulation of land and uh, harbor use. And these duties are largely carried out by volunteer commissions with some professional help. The fourth and final borough uh, government function is the mostly unseen administrative uh, overhead that comes with being a municipality of any size. That is, reports to Hartford, reports to Washington, paying bills, responding to lawsuits, maintaining buildings, and so forth. Not particularly glamorous, but uh, it comes, comes with being a municipality. How is the borough government structured? Fundamentally the same way it was in 1801. The original charter specified a warden, six burgesses, a clerk, a treasurer, a tax collector, and all of which we still have. It also created a few positions like bailiffs and haywards uh, that we no longer use. If anybody wants to know what a hayward is, you can ask me later. <laughs> um, so for 215 years, through numerous uh, charter revisions, we maintain the same basic structure. It's imperfect, uh, what organization isn't, but it seems to work. It works as long as there are enough residents who are willing and able to serve on the various boards and commissions that make up the government. And that's the problem. We're being squeezed between uh, a shrinking and aging population and government and that's government in general, which is increasingly complex and technical and, and uh, requires a lot of special knowledge, even for a tiny place like the borough. Like every other municipality in the state of Connecticut, we are expected to comply with OSHA, DEP, FEMA, ADA uh, regulations, and those are just a few uh, that I thought of immediately. Many of the regulations are very technical, and they require very special expertise to comply with. And if you don't, you can find yourself in trouble. So what to do? In my view, there, there are three options. Uh, and the first is the one that Jason mentioned, which is to do nothing. Uh, carry on as before. Hope for a sudden influx of smart, civic-minded young people <laughs> who don't have to commute to Boston or LA or New York or, or London to uh, provide for their families. Number two is to revise the borough charter with the goal of creating a more sustainable, perhaps streamlined government, perhaps reducing the size of the board of borough purchases, purchases, and even perhaps hiring a professional manager for the borough. And the third is uh, one that I suggested earlier, or hinted at earlier, which is to disestablish the borough and fully integrate back into the town of, of Stonington. We would have to create a new borough fire district to maintain the uh, fire protection services that we have, and perhaps create a village uh, tax district to fund services that the town doesn't provide, but which we wish to continue, like <coughs> brush pickup or something like that. All of these options involve risk, and the last two, revising the borough charter or dissolving the borough, uh, would require significant work. If we dissolve the borough, I can't just lock the door and take, give the keys to Ralph Simmons. That doesn't, doesn't work. There are state statutes that mandate how you do, do these things. But I think that option one, is, uh, which is do nothing, is in, in the end the, the riskiest of the three. Uh, but I also believe that if we confront the challenges that we face and work together, we can come up with a solution that is best for the future of this borough. And I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts during the question and answer period. Now in closing, I'd like to note that the borough's dilemma is not unique. Almost every day one hears or reads about communities somewhere in this country complaining about uh, change, about uh, things aren't the way they were in the old days, and that the government, whatever it is, is not coping with these changes. 
but it's not just in the U.S. Uh, last month, Lynn and I uh, were in Italy for two weeks, and uh, we heard similar complaints from people uh, where we traveled in Italy. Same things, change, tourists, etc. Uh, Venice's situation in particular seemed very similar to ours. A declining population, rising sea level, and uh, disappearing industries like fishing. So I'm considering forming a new borough commission, which will uh, work with the Venetian officials to come up with, <laughs> <laughs> uh, with a solution. <laughs> Naturally, this will require traveling to Venice a few times a year. <laughs> and uh, if anyone wants to volunteer for this commission or any other, see me after after the uh, talks are over. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. I think that framed that issue, that issue very well. And uh, while I don't provide staff support to the town, to the borough, I'd be glad to do it for the Venetian <laughs> So, uh, Our next speaker is uh, representative of merchant stakeholders. Uh, Deborah Norman will come up and tell you a little bit about what they're dealing with. Thank you. Good evening. I am Deborah Norman and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Stonington Borough Merchants Association. Tonight, I want to explore a question that makes our borough thrive. What makes our borough thrive from a merchant or retail perspective? <clears throat> Less than 30 years ago, we had three grocery stores, a dry cleaner, a general store, a hardware store, five bars, which we still have today, <laughs> <laughs> a school, and many year-round residents. But things change and times change. There are many factors that have affected how small business operate. Some of the largest to affect retail are the big box stores, or one-stop shopping. Then there's the internet, where one can buy anything at any time. And most recently, a sizable recession. So, how do mar merchants in a small town survive? That's the question. Over the years, the Stonington Borough Merchants Association has tried many things. Some have worked, and some have not. However, the common theme that has worked is getting more people into town. We are not proponents of huge buses full of tourists or carnival cruise ships pulling up and docking and having people streaming ashore. That's not what we're about. Here are a few things that have worked. The Stonington Merchants website, the nonprofit events such as Music in the Borough, garden and house tours, sailing and nest events, holiday strolls, farmer markets, the lighthouse, and other historic attractions. We have recently spent the majority of our operating budget with the help of the SBIA on advertising on national public radio. So these are some of the things that we are trying and we will keep trying. But now I would like to ask you, what would you like to see happen in town? That's it. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks for framing some of the issues uh, the merchants are dealing with in terms of not just locally but globally cha changing uh, consumer patterns. Our last uh, presenter this evening will be Spike Lobby to talk about the uh, nonprofit sector. Spike. Thanks, it's great to see you all here tonight. I am here, as they said, to talk about nonprofits, and hopefully those of you involved with them will uh, understand that I believe that the nonprofits are major contributors to the quality of life in the borough. Just the past couple of weeks, I visited the Stoning and Food Library, I exercised at the YMCA, played paddle at the Como Courts, attended church at Calvary, ate produce from the farmer's market, worked at, walked the Nature Trail at Coden Farm, visited the seaport and the aquarium with children and friends visiting, and I'm looking forward to the historical site of Gala next weekend. And importantly, we're all sitting in a wonderful nonprofit in the group, which is enabling us to have this meeting. For my family, though, nonprofits are especially relevant as I am a full time volunteer at NES working way too many hours, probably because I can't find a real job. <laughs> that was supposed to be funny for you, not funny for me. <laughs> While all these nonprofits are, are not located in the borough, we as borough residents get the major benefit of it. I have three main points to make tonight. First, the number and diversity of nonprofits is surprising. 
Second, nonprofits have a significant impact on rural life, and it's often, over, uh, often underestimated. And third, looking to 2020, the topic of this talk, collaborations will be really critical for success, survival, and building our community. In 2013, I participated on a steering committee that was led by Wendy Berry, who's here tonight, that assessed the impact of nonprofits on overall Stonington. Some of the conclusions I will make will be based on this work and updated for time and also folks in the borough. So first, the number and diversity of nonprofits is surprising. Estimated number of nonprofits in Stonington is 160 and the borough 35. That excludes personal kind of foundations that people use to make donations to nonprofits. We estimated that the number of this, these nonprofits in the borough have increased, but increased from 25 in 2008 to 35 now. They span a very diverse scope of activities, education, arts, health, religious, and clubs. The revenue growth estimated is from 210 to 2014 is 11.5%, well outpacing the economy. On the flip side, versus other county, uh, counties in Connecticut, none of our core nonprofits have quote unquote ceased to exist throughout the economic downturn. Interesting point. Stoning has 4.32 uh, uh, public charities per thousand people, whereas Fairfield County has just under three. What does that mean? Two, uh, nonprofits have a significant impact on borough life. Employment. Approximately 10% of our jobs come from nonprofits. Second, volunteerism. <laughs> Feeling good and supporting a mission driven cause motivates many people, and our nonprofits would cease to exist without good volunteers. Services the ones that they provide, but also their major buyers of services from other organizations like legal and accounting firms. Education and entertainment, not only programming and lecture series, but many of our nonprofits providing professional certifications. Social, community connectedness. We're a community in this room right now, but also clubs like the WAD Club, SHYC, are forms of nonprofits that bring together people, and that becomes a social network, developing friendships that maybe last a lifetime. Tourism, as uh, Deborah said, giving another reason to visit the borough. Influence over government policy, educating the public on current issues. Funding, attracting external grant dollars from outside the borough, supporting the borough economy. And one that I think is very important, reputation. As a community, how are we trying to add value? The Connecticut Association of Nonprofits said, the real value of nonprofits in the state is that these organizations provide the social safety net and cultural, educational, and historical, and heritage backbone of our community that will last a lifetime. So, looking to 2020, collaborations will be critical to success, survival, and improving our community. In Ness, we talk about growing the pie, the pie of sailing, green education, etc. Because if we argue over the slice of the pie, the pie won't get any bigger. I use this cartoon. It's up. That's been up there the whole time. Ah, wreck my punchline. <laughs> anyway, top of the thing, arguing over the pie, fighting over the slice. But if everybody can work together and collaborate, the pie can grow. So, crowding out is a major issue in the borough. Many nonprofits chasing the same dollars, they're chasing the same volunteers. Crowding out underscores the need for collaboration. Nonprofits working with other nonprofits to advance programming. Public private sector partnerships, maybe a for profit organization will be a non profit organization for a cause. Uh, maybe it's a medical cause, uh, MS, or anything like that. Many of those partnerships are going on throughout the country. As a result, many nonprofits are seeking out alliances outside the borough. For Ness, that's one of the driving factors why we now have seven locations outside of the borough in London, Westerly, thinking about Hartford and Norwich. So I believe in the future, nonprofits must demonstrate efficiency also. One of the benefits from the nonprofit roundtable was nonprofits got together to talk about shared issues like insurance or how do you manage facilities. So that type of collaboration to help reduce fixed costs is going to be important. Because the bottom line, funding, nonprofits largely survive through the strength of their donor bases, and collaborating will be key for their survival in the future. So I believe that a role in, that nonprofits and organizations have a major role in our community, and I look forward to working with other nonprofits. Hopefully that continues for a long time to come. Thank you. Great, thank you, Spike. Uh, we're now going to ask you to 
give you some, give us some of your comments. Uh, what I need to do though is I need to move my easel over here. I hadn't thought about the fact that there were going to be this many people, and uh, I'm going to need a microphone to maybe repeat questions or comments made. Thank you. Thank you. 
events. And as someone who has been the chair of the nominating committee for the vestry of Catholic Church for many years, I'm discovering more and more that candidates who are asked to serve have to decline because they tell me, Doug, we don't live here year-round, and Connecticut is not our legal residence. That is because of the tax issue. <coughs> and I fear that if that grows, we're going to have some wonderful civic-minded people <coughs> who are only here for six months. And their, their level of participation is obviously it's going to be restricted to the months that they are here. So there's no solution to it, but I think it's, it's something to consider on the horizon as more and more of I mean, this is an this is an older than typical community, and there are people I know who are who have said it is for them it's the estate tax. The estate tax is enough of a concern that they're, they're going to spend six months of the year somewhere else. Okay, thank you. It, it's, I'm sorry. I'm here. Oh yes, I'm on top. Sorry. Thank you. My name is Regan Morris. I'm asking. Consider enlarging the borough. We have young families, we have people who live year round, very close to us. Could they not be part of the borough? Could we not capture them somehow or invite them in or on or with us? Yeah, so the statement that was made in case everybody didn't hear it was would it be possible to enlarge the borough, expand the geographic boundaries that define uh, what the, where the borough is? And perhaps by enlarging the borough, the people that live in, the, in that new area um, could contribute. That we we gain uh, households that maybe are here year round or are younger. Um, perhaps that could solve some of the problems that uh, we've identified. Um, just, yeah, yeah, that, that's an option I hadn't considered because one, it would take the cooperation of the town to do that, and uh, it's, it's my my impression is the state of Connecticut. Would like to see all the boroughs go away and a lot of the towns to go away. They, the state of Connecticut would love to see more regional position and larger uh, entities, municipal entities. We, Connecticut is, is almost unique in the terms of the number of small municipalities we have, and it's very, frankly, inefficient from a, an overall point of view. So I think the state would oppose that, and we'd have to. We'd have to work with the state to get that done, and not, not to mention the town. I uh, guess. I, I can address as far as district formation. It's under the general statute. We have to vote in each of your districts to change the boundary lines. And many people don't realize that the Y Club, for example, is not in borough. It's in a, it's in a stone to fire district. Your borough line is very odd because the, the railroad was not here originally when you established the borough. Going back in the 1800s. So the lines do not follow property boundaries, nor do they follow natural boundaries, which would have made more sense perhaps to really look at that at some particular time. However, you would have to have legal votes within your borough and within the Stonington Fire District to change your boundary lines legally. Sure. Yeah, so that idea would require some uh, troubleshooting to figure out whether or not it was warranted and if, if the geography you were looking to expand actually was interested in being part of uh, the borough. Uh, yes. I'm George Avery, sort of a follow up on that. I uh, just want to be sure this evening everybody remembers the borough is more than a peninsula now. There's a piece of the borough that is bounded by the, the railroad track and sort of down on the way going out on Meadow Avenue, and there's some fairly substantial uh, residential areas there, and they abut other residential areas that are part of the town but not part of the borough. And in that area is one of the facilities that's subject to the most change going on at the moment <coughs> in regard to the purchase of this development. And the development mill is in the borough, and uh, it is having an impact, it's, it's changing use is having an impact on the, the long-time residents in that neighborhood. They are feeling it. Some of them are in the borough, some of them are not in the borough. They are in the town, and uh, they, there's a lot of confusion about how the land use issues created by uh, changing uses of the borough, uh, of the mill, uh, will affect 
be in one of the neighborhoods. But my major purpose was just to remind everybody that there is already a piece of the borough with a substantial number of residents in it uh, that uh, exists on the other side of the track. And indeed, I think my family owns the smallest piece of land in the borough. I think we own about 20 square feet. Uh, it's underwater in high tide. One, one of the boundary markers is on the shore of Walker's Dock. And at that point, we be on. And at that point, it makes a very sharp turn. But there is a borough stone there. And I think it's expected that we're here. But, so we have about 15 or 20 feet in the borough. And therefore, I'm interested. Yeah, you should understand. Karen Connor for Mills. I um, wanted to ask Jeff what the maybe top three or um, pros and cons would be of being incorporated into the town and, and losing the status of the borough. Well, the, uh, we, would, we would lose the ability to have our own plan and zoning commission. So. Um, yeah, so the first item that, uh, Jeff, do you want to come up here, Jeff? Because that sounds like a list of six items that we're looking for, right? I may only take a four. That's okay. Yeah, the, the, uh, if we were no longer a municipality, we could not have our own planning and zoning commission. And uh, depending on where you are and various issues that are going on, you might think that's a good thing or a bad thing. But we would lose that control that we have over planning and zoning within the within the borough, including the, uh, the other part of the borough. Uh, so that's one uh, thing is, I would say is a negative. Uh, we've been maintaining the fire, the fire department we've maintained. Um, to me, losing Sue and Roger as, as the people who take care of our streets would be a problem. Uh, you know, the, the streets are very quirky and those two have been doing still plowing and so forth for so long that they know uh, how to maneuver through the streets, and they know everybody. So if there's a car parked where it shouldn't be parked, they'll go knock on the door and get the person to move the car. And uh, that's that's kind of a nice uh, nice aspect to life here in the borough. I think uh, the pros, perhaps, just to give two of each, would be that um, it life. Uh, well, first of all, we wouldn't pay. We we still to maintain the fire district. We'd probably pay about half, at least half the tax we pay now to the borough as a whole. But you would see a decrease in, in your taxes. Um, and so that's one benefit, I suppose, is the taxes would go down. And, uh, you know, uh, the struggle to maintain the, the municipal government would, would go away. So that's two, two pros. Just make sure you're out of the job. Hmm? Third, you're out of a job. <laughs> I retired four years ago. <laughs> yes, right here. Uh, um, what latitude does the borough have to enter into public private partnerships that might be somewhat entrepreneurial in their flavor? Uh, for instance, to uh, rehab a building downtown, uh, thoroughly wired in the state of the art technology, and have perhaps offices available on an affordable basis so that younger people could come in and set up their shop in the borough and get them here during the day. So I don't know if there are uh, statutory or regulatory constraints on the borough's ability to work with a private developer or work with private entrepreneurs to jumpstart those types of projects, but it feels like it might be now worth exploring. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there are any statutory barriers to doing that. The, uh, there, there is a state statute that limits the amount of uh, debt we can carry, uh, but probably we could do something like that with one of these buildings within that ceiling. But obviously there'd be a cost associated with that and it might, it would impact taxes probably. Yeah, the, the P3 is something that a borough would be enabled to do if it were going to do that public-private partnership where uh, the borough may own land and the private sector may choose to build out the facility, whether it's the private sector as a for-profit or a non-profit. Uh, the statutes allow that to happen in Connecticut. It happens in uh, communities across the state. So the, the challenges become um, what is the, the, the public participation? You know, what, what is the public putting up and whether or not there's an appetite for that public participation? You know, is it money uh, or is it uh, the land? Whatever the component is on that side. 
Uh, yes, I have a little over there too. Well, my name's Alan Blanchard, and I guess my family and I have been part time residents for 60 years. Uh, but we are very much in the situation that Doug described is that you're only part time residents, and we can't afford for that to change for some of the reasons that Doug cited. It astounds me, I think I'm true, because we're starting to look at this, my wife and I are seeing it very, very seriously. But the estate tax situation in Connecticut is now far more punitive than the estate tax situation in New York. I never thought that day would be seen. Uh, the, the problem I want to mention is I think some of that's not going to change in the short term, and obviously it's beyond the scope of, 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 of anybody here. But I, I want to make the point that I think we are probably representative of people whose emotional attachment to this community is far more important, deeper than our, say, chronological attachment. All three of our children have spent every summer of their lives here. Two of the three have bought houses here in the last year. One in which I gathered the kids' names one night at the bar at Orange Street Cafe. Feast, Borough East, which is the area around the Bellas Mills and around the City Hall. <laughs> Actually, I think Vermont, you're not allowed to vote if, you, if you're not an actual resident. Uh, but, but here you can. So you can, that, that's one occasion when you can vote. Yeah, perhaps that's an opportunity to approve. I have you back there.
Since the uh, bells and bells come up a couple times, I, I should mention that on the on Monday, the I think it's the 27th. Are you? I think it's the 27th. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's the town economic development commission is sponsoring a sort of for open forum at Development Mill uh, for a dialogue between town officials, and I'll be there, but the neighbors and others who are interested in the Development Mill for whatever reason. So if you are interested, I encourage you to come to them. Yeah, we, we, you know, the uh, Economic Development Commission felt that there was a need for the neighborhood and the businesses that, that are there to meet each other and maybe uh, start identifying some of the issues so that we, we may not be able to solve all the problems that people are concerned about, but um, there may be some solutions for uh, at least some of the management issues that are coming up. So thank you for uh, reminding uh, that that's happening. I'm going to come to you second. I've got one first. Um, I think it might be useful uh, to separate uh, what I think uh, could be entities in the borough that I say looking at five or ten years are not really at risk, uh, or not so much at risk, both to themselves and to us as a community. And that would be, for example, the restaurants, you know, there's six restaurants, uh, they're all excellent restaurants, people come from catchment area pretty wide to go to them. Um, and the other is uh, the non-for-profits. Most of the non-for-profits, I think, will survive and do well. But, but those that are at risk are really why we started this whole concept. And, and that's the small uh, boutiques and merchants uh, on Water Street and in other places, the empty buildings. You see in other parts uh, nearby of uh, buildings being empty. And, uh, uh, and of course, the big problem, as you say, of more and more uh, residents, former residents of the borough moving south for six months of the day because of economic circumstances. So, um, you know, we need to think about the, the winter months, seven months or, or longer, is a really tough situation here in the borough for those of us who live in Europe. And we see it pretty much every day when we go to Tommy's shop and get a paper. I mean, every single day during the winter, I say, Tommy, how are you doing? Towards the end of the month, it's not doing that well. There are 12 or 15 of us that subsidize farmers, everybody knows. Otherwise, we would not have a, a, a public shop here. Um, the other merchants don't have that luxury of having, having that sort of gratitude, but Tom is kind of like a center of view. So how do you keep what you've got that's good, the small merchants, the barber shop stuff, and then the empty buildings, how do you lure in more people that are doing what um, the lady just suggested, those professionals who work from home on a computer, they have their businesses online, uh, and maybe what Spike has been suggesting is uh, consolidation, cooperation, and expansion. <coughs> I don't know what the answers are, but I just know that the borough is sort of heading to that situation where many of the shops in the borough would be closing for six months or more, uh, four or five years from now, unless something is done to keep the people coming in. Um, I'm Howard Park. I'm the street commissioner of um, My uh, What I wanted to do is address the belt mill uh, for a moment. Uh, the borough gave the land to the Lindfire brothers to build the mill here so that there would be an industry for the residents in the borough. So that is holding uh, its nature simply like New England is doing today. And uh, in the wintertime, it's actually quite a vital uh, small community where the uh, farmer's market is inside. It draws a huge crowd of people, either out of town or toward in town. But somehow there has to be a tie-in between what's happening on the uh, borough east and what's happening here in downtown. So there has to be a, a correlation, there has to be a connection, there has to be something that allows uh, uh, our residents to be able to go both ways. Not the residents that have to go south for the winter, uh, either economically or because they sort of like to be more whatever it is that they need. But the borough has to keep that vitality going. And in fact, the government does help a lot in doing that. Uh, and the second thing I want to say just uh, quickly is that um, we really owe Jeff Callahan a great uh, deal of strategy for the work that he does here at the borough. So, and Sue and Roger also. Jeff.
Good evening. My name is Nick Keppel, and I want to make one thing clear. I'm here, I, w I wear many hats. Uh, <laughs> so, one thing I'm not here as is uh, attorney for the borough. I happen to be attorney for the borough, but I'm speaking as a citizen. I have included my remarks with, with Jeff. I also um, am, am a president of the library board. Um, more importantly, the borough and its environs are super special to me because I've lived in three homes in the borough. I've lived in one home that split the property between the borough and the town. I now live in, in a home in the last 20 years just outside the borough over by the soccer fields on North Main Street. So I've been in the borough, but you know, betwixt and between and outside the borough. Uh, so, and I've seen, uh, my dad and, and his four sons moved a lot of furniture from New York up, up to uh, the borough as Tony Bailey's uh, book uh, sparked interest in, in the borough. Uh, so I, I've seen a lot of transformation. Uh, and it's, it's fascinating but also challenging, obviously. Uh, a couple of quick thoughts. Uh, first off, um, Unrelated to these specific issues, I can't emphasize to you enough uh, how important it is for people who care about this to actually be involved in addressing this. You know, as my, my background was in political science, and I, I continue to be amazed at how little people understand how much power they can and influence they can have if they merely participate. So I would just you know, strongly encourage people to to be involved uh, in addressing these. Uh, I also think that, that on the specific um, economic vitality piece, if we want to keep, as someone who has seen the transformation of the, of the business aspects of the borough from uh, a really diverse uh, village, as has been described, to uh, a different type of uh, economic activity in some respects, but if we want to keep what is here, we have to vote with our feet and patronize th these businesses. Even if you think you could get a better deal someplace else, if you want to keep these shops and these restaurants, and th then, then you have to act on it. Uh, lastly, on the, on the governmental side, I just want to share that, that um, um, I think there may be more options than, than we realized initially with regard to um, how we might structure things. When the town of Stafford, when the borough of Stafford merged with, with the, the town of Stafford, which happened in the early 90s, and when the city of Willamette merged with the town of Windmill, which I am familiar with because I represent a fire district, which was, was, uh, is in the Wind what used to be called the Windows. Um, Basically, the city of Willamette realized it couldn't sustain itself, so it basically uh, consolidated with the town, much to the chagrin of some people in, in the rural areas of Wyndham. But they created this, in both places, they created a service district. So, just wanted to, to share that if, and I'm not advocating that this happened, but if, on, on Jeff's, I think, second, I don't know whether it was second or third, but if, if one of the things that people want to think about is, um, changing the relationship that the borough has with the town, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. You could, you could con 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 consolidate with the town, but designate a borough service district, which would retain those, those certain powers that you wish to retain. And that, what, what that is, um, whether it's street uh, maintenance or, or other things, you know, is part of the, the discussions and emerges from people's interests. So, I just wanted to share that it's not an all or nothing thing. I also share very, very much, undeniably, as a as a personal uh, notion. I think expanding the boundary, the territorial boundary, out to like Route One would have would have some appeal. Uh, I happen to be somebody. Uh, whose property? <laughs> but seriously, uh, I think it would. You'd have you'd like double or more of the population. You'd have um, a broader pool of people to participate. 
you'd obviously have a broader tax base. Um, I think, no question, if it took seven tries to get harbor management, would it be universally beloved notion? It actually wouldn't. Uh, so there'd be, there'd be some resistance. But there is the argument that even though you might be subject to a tax in, in, up in, in the area between the borough and Route 1 that you're not subject to, you know, you'd also have the panache of being part of the borough. So I think there, there <laughs> no seriously, so there is an upside, there would be an upside to it. So it, if the state set the, bound, the territorial boundary, in my view, not having researched it, it can be changed. Uh, and I, I'm for sure not, I'm also, the other half of where is Judge Corbett, but I'm not going there this, with this crowd. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 